Welcome to NinjaCast, a photography podcast powered by Studio Ninja, the world's highest rated business management app built specifically for photographers. Listen and learn as the most successful photographers on the planet share their knowledge to help you transform every element of your photography business. Here's your host, Sally Shaw. Hi guys, welcome to NinjaCast. Today I'm joined by the amazing Kate and Brent. These guys are going to be talking to you about photographers just starting out in the industry and how they can really make their mark, how to create a strong personal brand for your business, and also how to master those lighting techniques that we all find so difficult. Let's get started. Hi guys, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us today. That was great. Yes, yes. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Oh, it's a pleasure. How have things been? Talk to me about the last few months. Oh, um, up and down. Uh-huh. And I think I think the the word that now a year in because we are all a year in. A lot of people say is I'm fine or I'm okay, uh-huh. and I think that's probably good enough. It's been it's been hard, and we're desperate to to get back out there really, but we've survived, haven't we? Yeah, we heard a funny one recently where they. You know, when everyone says I'm fine, somebody said, well, you know what that stands for? It's feelings inside not expressed. (laughs) So I think a lot of us are not expressing a whole lot. You know, I can't believe it's a year already as well. It's like March, uh, years gone by. And we have no like big events in the last year to to have a memory by. You know, we haven't done anything. So when you go, oh, you know, how's the last year been? It's like, really, it's been a year. Because we have those memory triggers, you know. Yeah, and we've had two. Poor, poor Brent is a step parent to my teenagers, so we've been in lockdown with two teenagers. <laughs> oh, lovely! Yeah. <laughs> that was that was a new experience. <laughs> I did the same actually for the first lockdown, and um, my stepdaughter came to live with us for four months. So I I was in exactly the same position. We would normally yeah. come visit every other weekend. And this time for the, for the lockdown, um, she came and lived with us for four months. So it was definitely an experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. It's something to not repeat again. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, for our listeners who maybe don't know who you are, or for those of them that do, that would just like to hear you talk about where you've come from and what you've done. Can you give yourselves a little introduction to our listeners and a bit about your journey so far? Sure. I think I'll I'll start in it because I've been in the industry for longer. It was definitely a second career for me. So I was in kind of marketing and branding and the world of TV, had the kids and basically had the choice to get back on a train into London or do something for me. So I learned photography as a hobby and it was the classic, you know, the one with the camera and people saying, oh, maybe you should, you know, do this for a living. And so um, that seemed like a very appealing thought. And, you know, I got trained and did uh, kind of a year long course. And then, yeah, kind of threw myself into it. And that, that enormous learning curve that is running any business, but certainly a photography business. And I started in weddings and portraits. They were my two, and the typical lifestyle photography journey. And then about two years in, I kind of discovered this world of boudoir that was going on in America that hadn't hit here at all. And I began to look into that and actually that became a really integral and I think most loved part of, of what I do. And I was, you know, really delighted during those kind of the first five, six, seven years to be um, an Nikon ambassador for the UK. Um, loved that. So I did quite a lot of industry talking and at the shows and meeting other photographers and that was brilliant and then it was around that time which wasn't brilliant but my kind of marriage deteriorated and my old friend Brent came back into my life and um that's when there was I think you know what I do and how we do it took quite a sharp turn and Brent can explain why yeah so from my side I mean I was in IT for 25 years traveling all around the world you know implementing systems which um, yeah, I was good at it. It was a good career, but it was so unrewarding. Um, you never got thanked for anything. The projects took two, three years, and you only heard complaints from from the big, you know, IT company or the companies we were implementing stuff to. Uh, and I became more, 
you know, disillusioned with all of that for a long time. So I'd always loved photography. I loved filming. I was one of those people that ran around with a camcorder putting little tapes in and filming everything that I could. Um, so I already had that sort of passion for photography, but, but really not from a professional point of view. And so then, you know, when Kate and I came together, um, I moved over back to the UK. I mean, I had lived already in the UK for 14, 15 years. Um, so when, when Kate and I got together, I sort of started to think about getting into photography again. And, and I'd, I'd gone out and looked for work and, you know, got a few offers in IT and I just, my heart wasn't in it. I just couldn't go back to it. So um, I started filming alongside Kate and really I've ended up filming weddings because Kate was shooting mm -hmm. weddings. And, and I, I guess I started out by, by offering the bride and groom, look, I'll film your wedding for you for free, <laughs> which was a really good tactic because it allowed me to, to learn lessons and I didn't have a client complaining because at the end of the day they were getting a free film. So, you know, I really started in that, in that regard, you know, filming people and, and, and weddings and so on. But, you know, I kind of looked at what Kate was doing on her own um, in terms of her photography and also she was mentoring and training. And I, and I said, well, listen, we, we can do this together and let's, let's create a, a business from it. You know, something that's not just bolted on to what she was doing already. And I guess that's how our training business came to be and, and also you introduced the whole drone element. Yeah. Because he's a, he's a trained pilot, so he could bring the drone element. And that's, been, that's actually been quite an interest. It's got us into working with, like, the royal palaces and everything, yeah. where you wouldn't, it would be much harder if you were trying to be another photographer or another cinematographer. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I have a passion for flying, but um, unfortunately flying in proper airplanes up there is very expensive. So the next best thing for me was to, to you know, flying like a model airplane being a drone whatever so it was a natural progress and it was a it was a nice opportunity to have you know boys toys to play with so it was an excuse to buy but it has really has opened up doors um you know i've gone through the qualifications to fly drones and and so on and so it's got us work in london where we filmed you know you know the the tower bridge and 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 what's that uh, Chelsea Place or whatever the uh, Chis 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 places like that, yeah. where I guess as a photographer or a cinematographer, you were putting your hands up to try and work there. You were one of many, where there are not many drone people that are available. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so I guess it really opened up doors in that regard and, and um, springboarded us into doing a lot of other work for them. I, I think a big frustration for Brent, though, was that he was filming on Nikon yeah. because, you know, it was really important that, we were on that platform and so when the and it's a two-year program with nick on the ambassadorship when that came to an end it was brent that actually talked to me about about potentially moving platform which i the, the concept of it to me was really frightening but he um it was definitely brent that brought sony to us in the sense that um and he did all his research and realized that gosh there's this holy grail of a platform that can work for both of us yeah, I mean, I went out and, and, and once I was free to, to explore other cameras and, and not offend, uh, you know, case position, uh, I hired loads of different other cameras and played with them and, and I came back to basically Sony being a hybrid that would really work very well for all of my needs from a filming perspective, would also do photography, career, you know, really well. And so I encouraged Kate to, like, you know, let's have a play with Sony and, and see what it feels like. So we did. Yeah. And haven't looked back, I guess. No. Absolutely. I came from a similar position to you, Kate, in that um, I was using Canon. I'd always been using Canon from the second I stepped into the industry. And a couple yeah. of years ago now, I switched to Sony. And ah. oh. look back now and think, why did I wait? Why didn't I do that so much sooner? Um, and I wouldn't shoot with anything else now. It's absolutely Possible, isn't it? So I completely yes. echo what you're saying there, and that you just get this epiphany moment, don't you? Of oh my god! <laughs> and has it has it changed the way you shoot? Yeah, it's it's definitely changed the way we shoot. Yeah. yeah, hugely, hugely. I I find myself trusting the camera so much more now yeah. that yeah. what I want it to do, it's capable of doing, and that what I you know what when I look at something and I see the final image. Actually, I see that it's got me a good way there. Whereas when I was shooting Canon, a lot of the time I was like, "Oh, there's going to be so much work to do on that afterwards to get it where I want it to be." Yeah, so, so it's been a huge game changer for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally and, agree. And for filming, it's a massively forward. You know, with things like eye autofocus, 
uh, it just blows my mind that I can film and that eye autofocus is, is sticking on the person's eye, the fact they're moving away or moving forward. And it's like, wow, you know, beforehand on, on, on any other platform, I was having to pull focus constantly. And it was just real workload. And, and so I really love it. Amazing. So when I did some research on you guys before this interview, I had this overwhelming feeling about your branding. Wherever you look, it's so strong, it's so prevalent, and I feel like just from your branding, I knew you guys really, really well. So oh, take some real work. <laughs> oh, that, that's definitely case department. She's she she comes from that background, so she's been she's been the whiz. In terms of our businesses with regard to branding, so oh god, I'm I'm like a proper brand bore, and and I think that all the lovely photographers who have you know come into contact with us through our training and mentoring know this, but it's it's so so important. And and I worked in the world of media, and it was only actually when I went to work for then a branding agency that I understood it. And I, the funny thing about branding is it's so obvious but so misunderstood. And a lot of people confuse it with marketing and indeed with advertising and, and kind of selling, but it is its own thing. And it's and it actually the thing that has to come first because the reality is if you actually step, and I think a lot of photographers don't do this, they don't step back and think about what we're actually providing. And, and the reality is a lot of photographers just talk about um, selling or providing photography. But actually, it's, it's not. You've got to start to think about how your clients feel and, and, and why, why they're going to part with money for photography. And that doesn't matter whether it's, you know, family, boudoirs are classic, or, or weddings. It's not just a tick box on the wedding uh, um, or if it, or those are not the clients we ever work with. I think that's quite interesting. And the other thing about photographers and you know, bless, we all think that it's all about the work. Now, obviously, your work should be consistent and it should, it should absolutely reflect your values and everything. But the reality is a lot of photographers are quite inconsistent with their work, yet feel like it's all about the photos. So when you look at websites, there are these tiny logos on very white websites and then it's just the pictures. But if the easiest thing to do um, is actually think about buying wine. And I've said this so many times. Like, I love wine but I don't know a huge amount about it. And so when I go to buy wine, I've got a budget in mind, you know, within, within certain boundaries. And then I'm faced with that, that supermarket shelf. And so I begin to judge what's inside the wine based on the, the, you know, what it looks like. So what the labels look like, the tone of voice, so how the wine brand is talking to me. And I make, you know, a, a judgment based on what's inside that bottle on what's outside it's and I funny because I do exactly the same I don't drink wine I'm not a wine drinker at all my husband is he loves red wine and yep. I will stand in the supermarket and I'll go that one looks a really nice one I bet that tastes really good purely based on how the label looks yeah, like, yeah. That's, that's a nice bottle <laughs> yeah and a lot of a lot of clients feel a lot of fear about about booking a photographer because they, they can't judge the quality of the work. And also you've got to think the trust element to buy a service. Now I know that we also provide products in, if, in a sense, but fundamentally when that initial transaction is made, these guys are buying a service they haven't experienced on, a, let's say weddings, on one of the most critical days of their life. It's massive. And you've got to tap into the fears and the and and the the motivations of, of why somebody is going to book you rather than just saying i'm a photographer or i'm a wedding photographer because it's not enough and the other thing about branding and about individuals is most photographers uh, brand themselves so that it's you know an, an individual but you know it can also be a generic but you've just got to think that be yourself i know it sounds so obvious but you know literally everyone else is taken you know that's the and and work out who you are and and what the because you can't become someone else when you're at a wedding behind a camera your personality is critical and it won't change on a wedding day so you've got to tap in to your personality type 
your values and and you've got to then find it's attraction you've got to find the people who will be attracted to that because you can look at another photographer and say oh my god their work is amazing but their energy and how they communicate will be so different to you that you're not you're not going to attract the same clients and a lot of photographers just fret about being booked rather than trying to actually talk to the right people I think it'll go a lot smoother, um, you know, for a photographer or a cinematographer when uh, the client, when you turn up to, to, to the wedding you, or you turn up to the shoot and the client says to you, you know, after a few minutes, you're exactly what I expected. Yeah. And that's because your brand, your website, your imagery, your, your films, everything have, have, have projected enough of you as, 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 as a creative across that when they finally get to meet you in person and, and, and work with you, that they go, you're exactly what I thought you were. Um, and and that's, that's, I think, is the perfect, the perfect match. Otherwise, if the client's kind of feeling, gosh, it's not quite what I expected, then, then you've misrepresented yourself, in that, I guess, in a, in a sense. For sure. So photographers out there that maybe are just starting out or actually mm. thought about branding seriously and you know they've just banked a logo on a white background and said this is me, where do they begin in finding out who they are and who they want their brand to be? A great, brilliant question. There's really two two elements to a brand and the first part is actually the the thought process, the thinking about who you are what you stand for let's bring it down to your brand values what you stand for and then it's how you communicate and how you sound and those are words so people can actually write them down and in the brand agency i work for we had four brand values and we had four personality values so you know i'm not um like a big loud personality so it would be really strange if my brand kind of sounded or, or looked like that um and we and actually we stand as a certainly the khs brand for um making people feel um at ease and it's so much about making people feel comfortable with photography because we don't attract and the easiest way to put this into today's context we don't attract the kind of influencer social media girls mm -hmm. Or, or men who are quite comfortable with who they are and loud and that's not who comes to us. You know, people come to us who, you know, aren't aware of how beautiful or gorgeous they, they actually are or, you know, or they have concerns that having spent a year planning a wedding, their vision of how they want it to look won't actually come to life. And, and it's, so it's a lot to do with, with our empathy and reassurance and trust. Um, but, you know, that's not for everyone. There's so many different personality types on the market. So number one is try and work out what you stand for and who you are as a person and as a business because they are connected with photography. And then the second thing is to bring that to life through what you'd call um, a visual toolkit of which a logo is such a tiny part of it, yet most photographers only have logos. And to just to put it absolutely clear, and this is where most photographers put their head in their hands, and I work with one of the best branding, like world-renowned designers. He was incredible. He recently died. It's called Martin Lambino, and he's incredible. And he said, listen, a logo is merely a trigger. A logo, when you see it, if you know it, triggers an emotion, positive or negative, or it triggers nothing because you have no familiarity with the actual brand. Um, and so he said, so actually a logo in its simplest form needs to work on a pencil. So if you can't read your logo on a pencil, so for example, if it's surrounded by dandelion clocks or who knows, it, you know, it's, that's, the job of a logo is not to, you know, kind of try to represent who you are as a photographer at all. All of that has to come into the design work, the way you speak, your colour palettes, so it's, it's actually, it's quite a big subject, as you can see. Um, but two areas. Number one is get your positioning right. And number two is work out what that looks visually. Amazing. And do you recommend that people take professional advice on that? Have you always done your branding yourself? Or have you always gone to, um, you know, a branding company that has helped you with that? So we've always done the, the strategy, the positioning strategy ourselves. We're always pretty clear on 
what we want the brand to look and feel like and then we will work with the designer to bring it to life and create the assets because you know at the end of the day uh if you are making wedding albums and and all of that you still want your packaging to be branded it's it's an experience you know when someone opens their wedding album that it needs to be surrounded with your brand and then the final part is the actual feelings and the emotions but they will remember that 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 feeling of looking at their wedding album and they'll associate it with you. And that's what you want with photography. You want emotion and then hopefully long-term relationships. Yeah. I mean, if you put in all the work and doing the strategy and, and working on who you are and, and what you like and what you don't like, then a good brand designer is going to be asking those questions anyway. Yeah. If they're not asking those questions, then they're not a brand designer. They're more of just a graphic designer. And I think that's a key is try to avoid a graphic design and have, if the person's asking the right questions around likes, dislikes, colors, and who you are, then, then they're, they're thinking brand. They're not graphically, mm-hmm. you know, making it up. <laughs> <laughs> and you touched on it briefly there, both of you, about relationships and having those long-term relationships. So how do you build those relationships with your client? I get from your kind of side of things, Kate, that that starts right kind of as soon as they – see your branding and as soon as they see your logo and they get a feel yeah. of who you are how do you then carry through those relationships uh, kate puts a lot of effort and, she, and she's great at this part um you know we do do a, a, a session with a couple or chat to the couple on, on, on video and not so much from lockdown we actually started doing that before lockdown because our clients are based all over the place they're not they're not local to us but you know there's a, there's a few times, certainly when it's photography and film, then we both chat to them. If it's just photography, then it's Kate. And she heads up to the office to go, I'm, look, I'm having an initial chat with her client, a new client. Um, and I, I won't, I'll be an hour, but she's not. She's an hour and a half or an hour and 45 because she's really putting them at ease and just chatting to them and making sure that they have, you know, all the questions that they want answered. But there's a lot of what you, I mean, you know yeah, what you do I, when you're sitting there talking to them. I, I think you've got to listen. Mm. You know, a lot of photographers talk at people and say, you know, this is what I do. And some of them say they're great at it. Um, and then they kind of ask for a sale. And we don't approach it like that at all. I, I, the first thing I, I say to a couple when I meet them is, you know, hi, how are you? But how did you meet? What, what do you both do? I spend 20 minutes talking about who, Please, yeah. Yeah, who they are. And their backstory. And- backstory. Um, and you know that that changes the dynamic immediately because often these days they meet online, mm-hmm. so you can see that slight embarrassment. And I'm like, God, don't worry about it. You know, like so many of our clients meet on. So again, you're putting them at ease, finding out who they are. They immediately relax, and then then I talk to them, and I and basically by telling them how we work, I am ticking all of the fears off. I know from ten years of eleven years of doing, I know what they're scared about I know the questions they're going to ask me so I gently talk it all through and then I say to them so listen you know I've done a lot of talking please now um what are your concerns Mm. what questions you have have, and what any worries fears talk to me and they just sit there and they go and they always look at each other and they're like gosh no I I think you've answered everything um and then the one they'll say is I'm not very photogenic and I say to them well that's absolutely not the case and I bring it into the reality of the world we all live in, which was not how Brent and I grew up. But, you know, my teenagers constantly photographing themselves and being photographed, but they see a range of um, awful to absolutely beautiful and probably manipulated, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, but, but for us, we controlled our image, didn't we? Well, I don't, you know, I think Brent and I are in our 40s. So we, we controlled our image. We were able to to make the decision if something was seen or not. And a lot of people now know when they can look nice, and that, but they also see the reality of, of not. And I just say to them, listen, we are professionals. We are going to put you in the right light, which is everything. Um, and then on top of putting you in the right light, we're going to be using the right lenses and, and everything else. And, and you know, we, I, I have to say, I, and I know that this is based on trust, but I'm saying you will be delighted with the results of consistently looking how you want to look across your entire wedding day. And you just see this relief kind of almost seep from their bodies of, 
of someone's reassuring me that I'm gonna, and it's not even that they want to look beautiful. They just don't want to look bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I and I I and I'm a very with with my personal relationships a very um quite a direct person since I love people I'm fascinated by them but I'm the same with my clients I just think cut the bullshit let's talk at let's talk about what you're worried about because I can then reassure them and it yeah and and that's because I know that that's where they're actually sitting there with worries and it's not about the price yeah and I think from a filming point of view you know clients they're not actors and they're quite worried but they want to film but they a lot of times they're undecided and 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 a big factor for being undecided is is they don't know how it's all going to turn out um in terms of you know are they going to have to put stuff on and and so i put their minds at ease and saying look i will work very hard to capture the natural moments between things happening just ignore you know, I use a camera that kind of, well, it's, it's a Sony Alpha, so it looks like a photographic camera. And I just said, just ignore me. I will work hard at, at getting the natural emotions. And then I'll work even harder in post-production to make sure I only put the nicest moments of what was happening um, in a highlights film. So that really does put them at ease. And I also do say to them, listen, I'm bec also because of my boudoir work, I'm super tuned in to flattering, not flattering. You know, it's really, I, I, I see it and I know it and I know what women do and don't like. And I will sometimes, you know, say to Brent, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, that's not a great angle. Let's just not put that in. Or, you know, I'm just trying to feel about how they're going to feel when they see it. And, and, I, and I, I think you have to remember that. It's not just because you, it, you have captured an amazing moment. And this always, this, okay, it's a big this is a big like, row in the industry because we never say that we are, in fact, we actively say on our websites, we are not photojournalists or documentary photographers, yet we are storytellers. So I say, of course, we're telling your story from start to finish. And a lot of it is um, playing out. I said, but if, if I happen to capture a deeply um, unattractive or, you know, photograph of your mum on the dance floor I'm not going to send it to you mm -hmm. now there'll be other photographers sitting there right now going well that's just a lie and da, da, da. and I'm like yeah, it's actually just a different approach which is I know it would upset my clients or the, their mum and that would destroy a relationship a long-term relationship and I know that because I've had clients we've met through boudoir family put commercial who have come to me and said things like our wedding photographs were awful you know they were it's so upsetting we've never been able to put them in an album can you can you look at them for me and I've had cases where I'm like I mean it's always very difficult and I've looked at images and I've said like I can see someone's used you know a wide angle lens super close to somebody and you know, and I said to them, well, we, we can actually adjust it a little bit in, in this, you know, and just saying it's not your fault. No, you don't look like this or your mother doesn't look like this. But when you're faced with the reality, it can be, it can be quite scary and quite upsetting. Mm -hmm. So we're not like everyone in the sense that we do, without changing people, we do try to show people in their best light. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, it, sorry, Brent, in advance, but I think because women do have that little kind of, Thing in our head don't we where we look at like I, I do I will do it with brides all the time and yeah. I'll look at them and think if we just twisted just that way slightly that'd be much more flattering or mm -hmm. you know if we just adjusted the light and let's turn you to the window instead of you know over it at the other side of the room this is going to look much nicer and it's just I think picking up on those little things isn't it yeah no, I agree totally I mean you know there'll be some people disagreeing with us that that's not truth and we do you know the classic question about posing over directing mm -hmm. you know do we pose our clients no and uh, we say this to we but we do direct and i say we direct you towards the nicest light we can find in that moment at a wedding because you you know we the three of us know and i hope lots of people listening that that can be a, a you know a challenge in itself mm -hmm. and you know once we get you into that beautiful light we're going to make sure you know, you, you're standing in a certain way and we do all of that. And then I say to them, and then we pause and we focus purely on being in that moment. You relax and you be yourself. So let's get everything. It's a bit like, you know, 
going action on a film. Everything has been thought about, but the actual moment has to be genuine and we don't speak, <laughs> you know, do we? Yeah, and, and we do as much as possible get back so that we're not too close in, you mm -hmm. know, put on like a 135 or whatever and, and just give them their space so that they can at that point start, you know, whispering stuff to each other and having a laugh and letting those natural emotions come out. Definitely. And they're not going to do that if you're too close. Yeah, 100%. I work very similarly in that I will, I say to my couples, very similar to you guys, in that I don't pose you, but I guide you. And I will, yeah. I will guide you to a certain place, and then I will let you be yourselves in that place. And that's yeah. very similar, I think. And I think, like you say, yeah. that's when you get those natural moments that you could have never prompted. Um, I had a wedding in October, and they were stood in front of this magnificent rock face. It was beautiful. The light was stunning. It was sunset. And he went in and he kissed her forehead as we walked away. And it was like a split second that I couldn't have asked him to do that. And it had looked yeah. kind of genuine as it hadn't done because we were further away. Yeah. yeah. And we, we talked to people about um, touch um, and, you know, but touch being so, so important. And, I, and you know, one of our best tips if people ever feel nervous about working with couples and particularly grooms who you have a sense might be uncomfortable and not quite know what's expected of them. We say, just show us that you're not her brother. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, okay. And I'm like, yeah. So it's small, intimate you know, touches and that you would never, if you were standing like my brother would sling his arm around me and it would be like, you know, completely different to Brent and I being near each other. And, and men understand that. And we're just asking them to show how they feel on the inside and try and bring it to the outside yeah. through, through touch and expression, really. Yeah, I've had, a, a, again, exactly the same scenario. I had a groom that was so nervous from the point of inquiry he was, you know, he was saying to me, I don't know what I'm going to do, what, like, what, what do I do with my arms, where do I stand, how do I, do I hold a hand, do I not hold a hand, do I look at the camera, do I not look at the camera? Yeah. He was running a million miles an hour in his head. Um, and I remember distinctly walking into these portraits, we've got them into this beautiful light, and he slung his arm around her shoulder like she was a mate down at the pub. And I said to him, I was like, this is your wife now. And he was like, yeah, and I went, you look like you're holding some, like, lad down at the pub, like you're going to put her in a, um, a choke hold or something. And as soon as I'd made him aware of that, it was like a completely different session. He was yes. you know, pulling her in at her waist and touching her face and all of yeah. it came flooding out because he stopped thinking about what he needed to do with his hands or his arms or his legs. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it, how just these little prompts is all we need. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Especially the guys. Hundred <laughs> percent, definitely. So you know, briefly touched on it already, Kate. But in terms of photographers that are new to the industry, that just think, you know, where do I begin? What is your best piece of advice for them? Mm. Okay, so I, I was very much somebody who came into the industry as a hobbyist, and I think that's in lifestyles uh, um, where the portrait is very, very, very common. Now, the reason there is such a a problem with imposter syndrome in photography is because most of us don't have or don't do any real kind of apprenticeship. You know, we, we, we don't go and spend a year or two years with a photographer and learn the trade. People are working more commercially studio driven do because it's the only way they're ever going to really make it. But it's the, the, entran the entrance to the industry is very easy for, for, for what we, the area we all work in. And that's a good and a bad thing because it means that you can say that you're a professional photographer and go out and put a website up and start working. But, um, you know, and, and to a certain extent, I did it. For example, I called myself a natural light photographer proudly on my website for the first two years out of fear of artificial lighting. Mm -hmm. You know, I made it, I turned it into a positive, but I knew in my heart that I was frightened of, of this. So that's my way of, of stopping somebody um, asking me about using flash or whatever. So I've always, the, the, the analogy I've always given is a, is a jigsaw puzzle. I think photography is a jigsaw puzzle. And when you start out, there's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of mi pieces missing. 
and every bit of knowledge is another jigsaw piece and knowledge is 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 confidence and confidence is great photography so you know it does come back to learning your craft and the biggest biggest thing is being able to see light now it's as simple as saying if the ones you you nodded so the people who know they see light know because you're haunted by it after them are you in those moments you're in beautiful light without your camera or it stops you dead and and i definitely know that there was a before and after light mm -hmm. element to, to photography for me so i don't think you can learn it from books i genuinely think you need someone to show you um but really take the time to to learn your craft yeah i mean i i think about when i first started out and and, and i joined kate and even when I was doing photography and I joined Kate on, on a few shoots as like a third, uh, not even a second, but a third, and something went wrong with the second and Kate threw a camera at me and said, get this fireworks, I'll be, you know, getting closer up or whatever it was. And, and that fear and that panic that just sets in going, oh. Yeah. So f I think a good analogy is you wouldn't get into a car and take on a 15-hour, you know, cross-country journey if you were unsure about where things were and, and how the car operated, you know, so it's the same with our cameras and our knowledge of light, light and, and how to do things. If you, if it's instinctive and you know that you've got, you know, you've got it down and, and it's just going to come to you, you know, if the, if the situation changes, you, you immediately going to dial in things as second nature. It allows you to then just be a, a creative as opposed mm -hmm. to somebody panicking inside about what the hell to do because this, your conditions have changed and your life has changed. So it is so important to just give yourself all of that knowledge so that you don't have that stress. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have that stress driving a car if you knew where everything was, which you do. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think it's so important. So there's, there's that, which is really, really important, is get your practical photography training. And then the other side is, is the business side. And it is massive. We all know how many hours we spend in front of a screen as opposed to spending out in the field. And actually, Brent literally had to drag me out of the Stone Age on so many fronts. So I would say to people starting out, you know, it's a completely different landscape in 2021 than it was in 2010 in terms of accounting software, in terms of studio management software, in term, you know, and, and I can't tell, tell you enough that get that streamlined and in place, so it's probably the bit you're least interested in doing, um, get your website SEO sorted out because Brent's done all of that for me, rebuilt my websites for me, um, and it totally transformed, you know, inquiries and everything. So it's all the stuff we don't, become photographers to do and you know and I'm sure we'll talk about this more but you know I can really explain to people the value of Studio Ninja because I paid someone a lot of money to do what Studio Ninja does for me so well I'm sure we'll, yeah Go so I, Go for it. <laughs> well it's you know in terms of so my you know I, I think it's a generally three-year window for most businesses to go from kind of just trying to, to make it to it going crazy. It's, it's quite common when I speak to photographers who it really, really happens. And for me, it was by year three, I was crazy busy. I still had young kids and I couldn't do it all. And you can never do it all. Now there's a lot of software, which means, my God, you, you can get close. Mm -hmm. um, still say you need to have an amazing accountant, um, 100%. But so I had what I called a studio manager. And she was actually a bride of mine who came to pick up her wedding album and said, Kate, okay, you look shattered, <laughs> you know? And I was like, I am. And she said, well, listen, um, I, um, she'd left her kind of full-time job and she was going to do kind of a remote PA and she lived relatively local. And she said, I'm happy to do a few hours a week for you. And I was like, great, brilliant. So she started and she was like, oh my God. I mean, quite quickly unearthed, I was a, had gone over the VAT threshold and was about to get fined. I mean, you know, small but massive things. Mm. So she became very, very important to me. And she was doing my contracts. She was getting my documentation ready for, for, the, for the weddings. She was basically doing all the admin. And, um, and I was paying her 
a lot. A lot. I mean, and one of the things that happened with Brent is when he came in, he was like, come on, Kate, we need to, you know, your costs are too high in the business. A very profitable business, but actually cost base was high because I also had a bookkeeper. And so Brent looked into all of it and it was a ra and we've tried different studio management software over the years. I have, and I've never, none of them have, have replaced a Becky. And then Studio Ninja, I have to say, I mean, we, like it's genuinely from my heart how much I love this software because it does what a human does, but better. It's more efficient. You can rely on it. Um, the, the time it has saved and the money. You see, it's not just, I know time is money, but genuinely from the heart, it's just been a transformative part of our business. I could not... We could not live without it, could we? Yeah. I mean, when I came in and, and Kate was doing all of the stuff and she talks about the Stone Age, uh, you know, having 25 years in IT, I really looked at the business and the businesses that we were going to, you know, create together and just said, God, there's, there's so much more efficiency through technology that we need to embrace it. I mean, this is what I spent my life doing for 25 years. So I just started to strip out things and replace them with technology and so on. And, and Kate spoke about having a, another a system, which, which she said, oh, I've, I've found this system and this is what I'm using. And I looked into it and it was like, it was so complex. I, even me, you know, with the IT knowledge, I was, this is just cumbersome. It, it, yes, it probably worked very, very well, but my gosh, you need a, a manual that thick to just kind of wrap your head around it. And I remember Kate coming and saying, oh, I've, I've heard about this software called Studio Ninja. Will you check it out for me? Mm. So she hands it across to me, and I started to look through it, and I went, oh, my gosh. You know, it's, it's, it's easy, it's intuitive. I kind of looked at it as that kind of reminded me a bit like Apple. It's nice and clean uh, interface. It was simple to understand. I said, yeah, this, this is really good. We, we really need to look into this. And so, you know, that's, yeah, and my gosh, um, I love it because, you know, we've, you know, we've been away uh, uh, in Croatia and, and, and it's been working away and, and we've signed work while lying on a boat at sea and, and just, you know, do, you know, hitting yeah, something. They've taken deposits, they've signed it, so they've approved a quote, they've paid the deposit and signed the contract while we've been out on a boat yeah. during the day. You know, and I mean, you're like... This, and this it was, is amazing. And it was for a Royal Palace wedding. So yeah. we were like, yeah, this stuff is really good. Yeah. Um, you know, it meant that because we, you know, we run the business together, there's no downtime. It's, you know, board meetings are in the bath, you know, on the bed, at the breakfast table. We, we discuss business constantly. And so when we did go away for a holiday, it was just incredible to, you know, we didn't have a studio manager anymore. And so it was like, okay, what are we going to do? And while we're in holiday, it was like, wow, you know, actually the little automated system mm -hmm. is sitting there doing the work for us. So it's, 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 yeah, it gave us a holiday, that's for sure. And I have to say, for those photographers who haven't had Studio Ninja during coronavirus with having to move weddings, yeah. I cannot imagine the hell. I feel sorry for me. I cannot <laughs> imagine the hell for me. Studio Ninja is, keeps me on top of all those date moves, all the co new contracts being signed. It's like, actually, it's just, I, it, and do you know what it does? It just, you don't get the anxiety, do you? It takes the anxiety away because you're like, no, the machine and the software is yeah. my brain and it's better than my brain. <laughs> and, the, and the clients still have access to their, you know, to their, their login area and they can see that the invoice has changed and it's shifted and the dates have changed and it also keeps them calm. Yeah. That they're not trawling through emails to try and find the thing that you sent three weeks ago offering up these dates and so it's just it was brilliant. Definitely. I knew I used Studio Ninja as a photographer before I worked with Studio Ninja and I remember distinctly that moment of going, Wow. <laughs> And I used um, another software, I was trialing another software, and like you, Brent, I just thought, Jesus, I need a degree to try and yeah. set all this up. Like, I feel like I need to go to uni for three years to know what I'm doing with this. Exactly. Yes. And then I stumbled across Studio Ninja out of recommendation and just went, that, that's it, that's what I need. Um, and as, again, you know, for my photography business, I've never looked back. It has absolutely saved my bacon so many times over during coronavirus when I've had like 10 emails flooding at once that 
three of them want the you know the same all the same date but then someone's confirmed another date and there's just so much going on isn't there over this past yeah. year in terms of our industry and all these administration tasks that we have yeah. to do um, but I know that our community have said time and time again that I've seen on social media you know I don't know how I would have dealt with all this yeah. if yeah. it wasn't for being able to input all these different dates so quickly into Studio Ninja so yeah it's really yeah. It's lovely to hear and I know the team you know it goes straight to their hearts when they hear things like that the support team our development team Chris and you and themselves as well and um, it does get back to every single one of them um, and you know they're so grateful when they do hear things like that because they you know we're genuinely making a difference to the industry which is lovely but actually just on the issue of the support my god they're back to you within minutes <laughs> yeah, really. I, honestly it's incredible you know because it's very rare these days <laughs> and then, you know one of the other things I love is that um, as part of getting rid of uh, the bookkeeper um, bless her she was lovely but but you don't need a bookkeeper when we can do accounting online so we've got a great accountant but I do the bookkeeping so for me with Studio Ninja the fact that it integrated straight into QuickBooks for me is like tick yeah. Um, yeah. because I do bookkeeping like on a Monday morning for like half an hour done and it integrates with Studio Ninja so I was like so happy with that Love that. So you guys are also educators, aren't you? And we've touched very, very briefly for our yeah. chat today. Can we delve into that a little bit more on that side of things and um, talk to us about how that got set up and how it runs now? So I think, yeah, Brent mentioned that I was already mentoring um, uh, photographers, but much more on a one-to-one. On a -one. And I did a bit of group training, but it was all, you know, around my schedule, really. And it was... Yeah, Brent, on, in fact, I got an email one night from somebody who I'd done some mentoring with and it was just a really emotive, made me quite emotional, but just because of how she felt and it was a confidence, a real confidence move for her. And Brent, yeah, well, you can say, yeah. You know, she was sitting on the sofa and she was a bit emotional about, the, about this response from somebody, you know, that, that you know, Kate had changed her life for her through the mentoring and that kind of stuff. I sat down on the sofa next to her doing what I normally do. And I said, right, well, you know, this is, you've been doing this for a while. It's brilliant. Um, let's turn this into a training business. And um, he kind of looks at me with wide eyes going, really? I'm like, hey, come on, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's just formalize it so that, so that um, we can manage Kate's time. And, 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 you know, eventually I started educating on the, on the filming side as well, but it started mostly on photography and the mentoring with Kate. But, it just allowed us to formalize it, put it out there, and also schedule time with them. So, you know, we ended up doing quite a lot of training outside of the season because that's mm -hmm. when photographers are free. But at least there was a schedule to it and people could, could um, come along and, you know, join online and, and that kind of stuff. So it just made it more simple. Well, originally, Brent was, you know, typical IT head was thinking, you know, should we do something online? And we were obviously looking into the creative lives and all the rest. And, and we very quickly realized that actually what we wanted to do was the very opposite. Mm. So we wanted to go back to really intimate small group training um, where you can ask questions where no question is stupid. And, and I've always trained in a very different way to a lot of, and again, there was a male female thing, a lot of, not all, but a lot of male photography training is very much based on the, um, technique side of it and the the actual camera settings and and it's all quite um kind of black and white and and actually they often don't realize that people are missing big knowledge gaps so they're explaining flash and speed lights but they've they've not understood that these photographers don't even understand what's happening with sync speed they don't even understand how flash works alongside available light and with shutter speed and they don't get it so therefore because i remember going to my first flash training in 2009 or 10 and i came away totally overwhelmed uh, and it didn't go in and it was only a few years later when i kind of really did i actually kind of taught myself and went back to basics i realized oh god what's that bit's explained so my most popular course ever has been learn to love your speed light which is literally, a, I'm going to take you from hating this thing to loving this thing in four hours. And it was unbelievable. We had so many photographers come through and they just, you know, wrote to me, sent, me, sort of sent us pictures afterwards, just saying, oh my God, I used it. 
you know, so much at the wedding, um, a sunny summer wedding, you know, but again, just uh, the confidence because as, as we kind of both said at the beginning, with, if you're lacking confidence, you can't, you can't be creative. Yeah. You're just running through weddings absolutely panic. petrified <laughs> yeah you're just in a state of, of panic and, and, and i've experienced that myself the other thing we did with training is we also made a conscious decision to say uh, we want to keep it small and intimate so it's home from home we do it from you know we're in our garden office right now and there's beeping going on because there's a building site just back there but but it's um it's restricted to eight people only so that so that we can spend hands-on time with everyone that when someone walks away from the training course they don't feel like they couldn't ask the question or they didn't get time to to get that moment to just kind of have some one-to-one -one attention although it's only eight of us we still need to be able to try and give everyone that piece of time so actually kate and i always do the training courses mm -hmm. together kate might be delivering it but but i'm there to also you know um help two or three people that that aren't currently talking to kate or whatever it may be so yeah we keep it small intimate and down to eight people only and actually when we when sony asked us both to be um european ambassadors which you know is amazing and we have a brilliant relationship with sony we, it's a great culture and a, and a lovely team but they actually asked us so how how can we use you as ambassadors what you know how do you think you can you can make a difference and we said you need to put sony kit in photographers hands because until you see it and feel it you know, it's a, such a massive concept to switch platforms and brands. And so, again, you know, it, we use the training, our training by Lumiere kind of brand to help Sony, you know, put kit in hands. And it was, yeah, we, it, we, a lot of people switched, <laughs> you know, because it's a massive decision, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, having been through that myself over the past few years, I was petrified about it. Yeah. Like physically felt sick at the thought, sick. and then as soon as I got it in my in my hands, I was like, done. Like, yeah. I may as well just like sign on the dotted line now. Like, it's not even in comparison. So, yeah, yeah definitely seeing is definitely believing, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Amazing. So, if you guys um wouldn't mind delving in a little bit more about the Sony side of things. What are your plans with them at the moment? Are there any? Is there anything coming up? Um, kind of hopefully when things come back to normal after COVID. Yeah, we've had a lot of requests. I mean, there's these these. When, well, we were just talking about it earlier. The, they were called Sony Experience Days that we ran, and and they were in conjunction with Sony. Um, you know, and they were they were. You know, kept to, to an absolute minimum cost. Basically, the cost that was charged was was just to cover a bit of food. And Sony was really putting up the amazing venue and bringing a whole ton of equipment. Um, so we've had a lot of requests from people going. We've heard about the Sony Experience Day. When you're running them again, and obviously, it's so difficult to be able to turn around to to everyone that's asked us when we're going to run them because we don't even know when we're going to shoot the next wedding again because of COVID. But certainly, Sony have said to us that. Um, you know, once the world opens up again, they, they they loved running the Sony Experience Days. They kind of put it into their budget. They want to run more. They want to. They see the value in actually allowing people to to have kit in their hand. And it's quite a different experience to having the kit in your hand at a photography show, where all you can do is inside the building, as opposed to actually having a bride and groom model or or children or or couple mm -hmm. to to get out in the field and actually use it in the environment that we all generally use it in so yeah i mean we we certainly have the expectation that we would put these on again once the world is allowing us to do so mm, what they certainly try to do understanding you know once it was clear this this virus wasn't going away quickly um they actually took brent and i across to sicily um in the one week i would very lucky to have been able to do it but with the production team we spent gosh four or five days and we filmed for the um for their kind of alpha platform uh specifically about weddings so i did the photography so shooting weddings on sony and brent did you know filming weddings on sony but we said that originally there was talk of doing two completely separate things and we said look no actually more photographers need to Sony photographers need to understand the amazing 
video capability of these cameras. So if we're side by side doing this, it's going to really help people understand. And so that I think should be on a platform really soon. But if anybody, that's not just for people who are considering changing, because obviously we talk about all the incredible features, but it's also for people who have potentially switched to Sony, who um, maybe aren't using the cameras to their full capability. So uh, it's really good that they basically realize, come on, let's at least film something remotely that yeah. we can put on a platform and get out to people. Yeah, and we try to focus a lot during the filming and the training in, in Sicily to, to practical things that, that we use in terms of the kit, you know, the simple little tricks that we've learned, mm. techniques that we've learned to actually you know, use technology to your advantage. There's this button that allows you to do something and actually there's a little hack that allows you to, you engage it and disengage it and it'll do a whole lot for you in terms of filming. Um, it would make sense, when, you know, when, you, when people are able to watch mm -hmm. that, but it was tips like that, that we were just trying to share what made our lives easier yeah. um, while shooting a wedding using Sony gear. So yeah, when that comes up. We'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> It was deeply uncomfortable because normally um, we're this side of the camera um, and and for five days we were on the other side of the camera and it's just not, you know, we, we you know, I wanted to run behind the guys that were filming us to, you know, get get active in that role, not be the person sitting in the, in the camera lens. It's a good reminder about how your couples feel. Yeah, it, it really yeah. was a wake up for us just to, you know, realise how tiring it is um, and, and how you feel. Yeah. And we were also both just at that worst end of, or, you know, you, when you're at, you put the most weight on from coronavirus, from drinking wine and eating chocolate. Well, you don't drink wine, we do, and eating chocolate. Uh, and uh, so we were like, you look at it now, we're like, oh gosh. And what it did for me was it, it got me um, kind of keeping fit again. But just a, a reminder for wedding photographers been really on my mind is that every at the start of every season so we normally begin shooting around March April big weddings um, and Brent and I always talked about the first two or three when you're getting um, wedding fit yeah. again as in you are exhausted on the Sunday your whole body hurts and so I've actually been um, doing quite a lot of workouts and with weights and everything just to because otherwise I think we've all forgotten Mm. And we're going to start again, and I think there's going to be a lot of pain. It's going to be brutal. <laughs> brutal, yeah. Absolutely. And do you know, it's, it's a rumble that I think not just you are thinking about, Kate, but I've heard it quite a lot in the industry that people have all of a sudden gone, well, I've not really shot a wedding in a year. How on earth am I going to do it now? Because it's like long hours, carrying carrying, yeah. carrying equipment, and you're always going a million miles an hour. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I absolutely... I'm not looking forward to those wedding hangovers one bit. <laughs> no, wedding hangovers, that's brilliant. That's a good one. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> so, guys, if you could start your careers all over again, is there anything you'd do differently? Yeah, studio ninja. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I don't think it existed, actually. Well, it didn't because I was 2009-10, but um, it should be, you know, like a primary purchase it should, yeah, it should be the main thing yeah that when you set up your studio as part of your production uh, studio and it should be integral to that and then your your accounting software plugged into that and sort out your email and sort out your website um but 100 percent and and i'd say the other one would be um put the effort into it, understanding and and working more with seo for your website I think a lot of people put so much emphasis on getting a great looking website, but it's going to be, you know, an amazing website will just be standing on the edge of the cliff shouting into a big wide open ocean with no, no boats out there to hear you. Uh, yes, what Kate talked about in terms of branding, those are very, very critical, but I think the biggest element to the, the website would be making sure that the SEO works because you need to tell Google who you are in words. Images won't necessarily explain who you are for this big old search engine that's sitting there crunching away all the time. So if you want to be found, SEO has to be done correctly. Love that. Fantastic. And if you guys could add perhaps a final piece of advice, something that changed your lives massively business-wise or personal-wise, what would that one piece of advice be? You can go one each if you like. <laughs> 
Uh, well, for me, it was meeting Brent. <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, because, because, you know, I think just going back to the nobody's, nobody's brilliant at everything. Um, and he has, you know, together we're so much stronger than, than we are um, on our own. But really just to then reiterate, if you are doing this alone, which so many people are, and I've, you know, I did it alone for years, um, just get all the help you can from, from the, the, the tools, you know, just going back to, to, the, to the Studio Ninjas, to the accounting softwares, um, because otherwise you will soon fall out of love with it. Mm. You know, that's the thing that a lot of people who start their own businesses, once the balls are flying and they start to drop them, this love affair can take a big knock because you soon realize that you don't have any downtime that, you know, that it's taking you away from life and, you know, so yeah, just, just fill those, fill those holes so you can focus on the photography rather than picking the balls up and, and, and having upset clients that it's not necessary to have. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I come from a technology, I come from a technology background, uh, you know, in IT and, and I would just say, uh, allow technology to work for you and I'm going to sound like I'm repeating myself we've gone through the whole lot and Studio Ninja brings it all together so you'd be crazy not to let software like Studio Ninja take care of so much because it automates so many things that allows you to have so much more time I mean that's I mean I've always applied that principle in terms of our businesses that it's automate as much as we can so it's it's really great that there's software out there that actually allows you to do that I mean I had to really like my work life balance was off it was oh. so so off for a, you know a long time and and Brent was like listen if we're going to spend our lives together and get married and do this then uh, you have to change yeah. on this front because it's not worth it Ultimate. You know, and, and actually what he's saying is, yeah, it's not that you won't be doing running your business as well. You'll actually be running it more efficiently and still get some quality time back. So yeah, he's taught me, cool. a, he's taught me a lot because I'm very much somebody who I'm not controlling, but I, I, you know, I, I don't give things up easily. Um, and he's, he's taught me the value of, of, of stepping back as long as you can trust, I guess, the, the things you put in place. Yeah. Amazing. Love that. So everyone needs to find themselves a Brent and everyone yeah. <laughs> But not this one. Invest in software. <laughs> <laughs> not this one. He's mine. <laughs> Amazing. If our listeners would like to find out a little bit more about you guys, they'd like to get in touch, pick your brains, find out more about the training side of things, how can they do that? So we have uh fundamentally I guess three websites and listen, we're not we're not the best on social media you know it are we <laughs> and it's a lot to do with having teenagers i'm not the biggest fan of, of social media um so we've got a uh, training is training by lumiere and it's the french for light so l-u-m-i-e-r-e -E. um our kind of destination wedding business and um, cinematography is uh, just by lumiere and then uh, it's kate hope Paul smith um, dot com is you know the kind of boudoir and and even food photography all, all that side of things so the best place to reach out to brent and i is definitely email yeah. or or websites um uh, you know you just might not hear back from us on social media within five minutes it'd be more yeah. like 24 hours <laughs> Love that. we feel a bit bombarded when it's when yeah. it's so many different platforms and you lose track of where that message pinged up on your screen and then it disappeared and like i can't remember was that instagram or facebook or the, yeah. the solid way we, we're a bit old fashioned is we look at our inbox and there it is. We'll respond in there and you'll certainly get us on, on email as opposed to social media files. Although we have just discovered clubhouse and um, I do think that clubhouse is, is an interesting one for photographers. Um, I think it's quite nice to take the visuals aside and for us all to be able to just talk as, as people. And we're, you know, talking to Sony about, Sony becoming part of it and joining a conversation because I think there's a huge value in this in, in talking, talking rather than you know just looking at work the whole time. Yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely lovely. Well, thank you both so much for your time today. It has been such a pleasure. I've loved every second. Um, I can't wait for the listeners to be able to soak it all up the same way I have. Um, so thank you again for your time. No, oh, thanks thank for having us and big thank you for Master Studio Ninja just, yeah. just for existing. <laughs> yeah, thanks from the bottom of our hearts for you know, coming together and, and, and being the software that can make our lives different. Oh, bless you. I can't wait to catch up with you guys in person after all this has all calmed down and, uh, and all will be a distinct memory, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant and so hopefully maybe we can do something with you guys and sony i think sony would love that as well yeah that would be awesome i'll catch you guys very soon all right take all care, right, cool. take care. Bye. 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 Okay, guys, that's everything from me today. Thank you so much again to Kate and to Brent for joining us on the show today. I loved every single second and there's loads that I'm going to go and implement into my own business tomorrow. If you'd like to see the show notes, you can head to www.studioninja.co forward slash episode 29. Please don't forget to rate us on the podcast platform that you're listening on. A little bit of love goes a very long way. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of NinjaCast, brought to you by Studio Ninja. Beautifully designed and super easy to use, Studio Ninja will help you manage your leads, clients, shoots, invoices, contracts, workflows, and so much more. To learn more or start your 30-day free trial, go to www.studioninja.co.